Bob. Mate, so why don't you tell us? Why don't you tell us what what you do? What's your what's your gig at Booper? So my role, uh, I'm head of global content strategy at Bupa now, and I guess uh, my remit in a nutshell is how do we start to develop an enterprise-wide content marketing strategy um, to better connect us with customers and drive commercial outcomes. And your background is media, comms, PR? Completely. It's I'm probably for someone who's now in a in a marketing role. I've come through that traditional sort of, as you say, media PR. Um, I've been in corporate affairs roles for a long time, and I guess for me, I started to get really interested in social media probably oh, seven, six or seven years ago, um, when I was in a in a corporate affairs role at Booper, and I guess. For me, it started from an issues management perspective. So it was looking at uh, when issues escalate in traditional media, how do they then move over to social and how as a business do we start to counter that? And I guess it was at that stage that I started to realise the real power of social media and it was a real um, light bulb moment for me. And I think ever since then, I guess I've been on... uh, you know, that started a journey for me of looking at going, how can we use different channels, platforms to engage as opposed to just manage issues? And do you reckon that coming through that PR where, you know, it's pure, raw, authentic comms, you know, you, you've got to listen as much as you do talk. Um, do you reckon that's really helped you for the content side? Because I think when it comes to PR, you know, we've always done content. I, I like to tell people that I was doing, you know, big newsletters in the, in my first days of uh, being a PR consultant. Albeit the big change, I think, from then to now is that then it was all about the company and all the client and how great they are and awards and their products. And now it's it's not that at all. It's all audience first. That's probably been the, the, the biggest shift. Yeah, you're spot on. And I think for me, I mean, as as PR professionals, we've probably done 60 to 70 percent of content marketing our whole careers without realising it was called content marketing. It was just an integrated PR campaign for us. So you'd have, you know, you'd have your white paper and your media release and you'd have a site you drive people to, et cetera, et cetera. I guess and I think on that bent of coming from from that media background, what what we in that industry inherently have is this sort of intuitive understanding of what is newsworthy or what is going to resonate for people. And so that that is invaluable for me from a content marketing perspective because we're not looking at it solely from a how do we yell at people and sell products. It's more how do we engage and what does that what does that need to look like? Um, and, and it's something that's you know helped immeasurably. I guess when I talk about we've probably done 60 or 70 percent of content marketing where I've had to really learn and develop is the digital aspect. So, you know, SEO, um, retargeting, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that to me is is an easier skill to learn than than learning what is and isn't newsworthy. And I guess the other thing is that you can always tap people on the shoulder for that, for those specialists, because you can't be you can't be specialists in everything. And and you know, there are people that can pay a lot of money just to focus on the analytics or just to focus on SEO. And I suppose as as a someone overseeing, you know, corporate uh, sorry, um, content strategy for an for the enterprise, you just need to know when to put it in and when you're not being snowballed and and uh, you know have an understanding of it without deep, deep, deep diving. Completely. And look, if you speak to, you know, you don't even need to speak to the SEO team at Booper, I'll tell you, I am not an SEO expert, but I get how critically important it is. So, and as you say, you know, that's, there's, there's different people who can, who can really dig into how do we drive organic traffic and what does it need to look like and what's the architecture and, you know, all of, all of those sort of elements, which is their key skill set. I think for us, it's just looking at it going, we've, we've got all of these different elements that we need to, we need to be able to use. Okay, so let's walk us through uh, now, Bupa being the health insurance giant, uh, global, you've started doing the content uh, in Australia. Um, we'll, we'll dig into that in a tick. And then obviously um, now, you know, you've got global in, in, in your title. So I suppose it's, uh, it's inevitable that uh, an organisation such as Bupa will go global with, with content. So was Australia kind of first out of the blocks in this space? It, it was. I mean, the the three of the major markets that Booper plays in globally is Spain, UK, and Australia. 
Um, and and I think it is fair to say that, that Australia was the first to move in in this sense. I mean, every every organisation has always done content, um, and you know, Booper had always done content. I, I think where where we changed with the Blue Room was looking at how can we start to develop content marketing and have content as a business asset, um, as opposed to just producing content for the sake of it without without a strategy in terms of what do we want that content to be able to do and what action do we want people to take. So you've mentioned the Blue Room, so let's uh, talk, take us through, that's your, let's call it a content property, it's, uh, I, I call it like a sub-branded content property um, that it, you know, it's it's like its own online mag magazine. Once you walk us through, um, how did it come about, why did you do it, how, how long has it been going for? Yeah, I think I think for me the the part of the real beauty of the Blue Room and part of its its success um, externally and internally is that it was grounded in in business in business strategy and business need as well as customer outcomes. So if I look at Booper in Australia, as you've said, where you know we're well known as a health insurer, we're the largest private health insurer in Australia. But we do a lot more. So where I think it's the largest private or the largest private aged care and retirement uh, sort of group in Australia and New Zealand. In Australia alone, we also offer rehabilitation. We've got pet, travel, life, you know, all of these general insurances, massive dental network, massive optical network. You know, we do medical visa services with the government and we operate GP homes and the like. And the reason I bring up all of those products and services is a lot of people aren't familiar with them and they just see us as a health insurer. And I guess for us, that was the business opportunity. So as part of our strategy to reposition the brand, it was around how do we let people know about all of the products and services that we operate. And obviously, you know, that was grounded in to continue to drive growth and the like as a business, that's where a lot of the growth is going to come from. So while we were embarking on this, on this repositioning strategy, and part of that too was based on the fact that we want customers to love us, you know, and, and all brands do that, that we're hardly the first to, to think of it. But what was really interesting was when we spoke with, spoke with people about it, they, their propensity to love us increased significantly when they found out, found out about the other products and services that we do. So say our, our you know, person first approach to, to dementia and aged care homes and the like, and some of the fantastic things like, we did a great yarn on the Blue Room about an aged care home that has dogs there, you know, and the residents love it and it's grounded in medical research. And it was a beautiful content piece. But when we talk to people about those things, that, that is truly customer or resident first, love for Booper goes up. So as part of that, we started to look at, well, we obviously need a, a digital hub to be able to amplify and tell these stories. So while the, the brand strategy was being developed, the content strategy was being developed and they came together in this perfect sort of union. And that was really the genesis for the Blue Room. So it was, how do we create a, you know, a digital marketing or publishing or content or whatever name we want to do it, hub yeah. that will let, let us engage with customers and talk to them um, you know, about the breadth of services we offer and our skills and the like, but how do we do that in a way uh, you know, that, that we're operating like a publisher and we're providing that utility rather than just trying to sell things? And I think if I look at, look at the objectives, you know, of part of the objectives are around increasing people's understanding of the breadth of services, you know, how do we become more loved and then how do we, and ultimately, how do we start to drive those commercial outcomes like purchase consideration, you know, and ultimately sales and the like. Yep. yep. All right. So it's, you've done so much with the Blue Room. I mean, you, you are virtually a, a media company. I mean, it's not just an occasional blog post you're putting up. Why don't you walk us through how big it is, um, how many articles you've put up. Uh, I've got some stats here, but, but you've done a lot more since. So maybe I'll just look at the stats for two ticks. Uh, this was from an article that was uh, in Marketing Magazine. Um, so if, if you can update, this is the best we can. But this was after just, in just over a year, uh, according to this article, uh, you'd done 915 original articles and 152 videos and attracted 2 million unique visitors. So let me talk in turn. 
In, in terms of the pieces of content, there's a lot more. Um, I don't have a have an exact number, but I mean, it has increased significantly. Um, and I think at last count, and this was looking at it midway through last year, there were, it was three and a half thousand pieces of content or content assets or the like that were on there. And it, it continues to grow every day. Um, in terms of the traffic and, and some of the metrics and the like, I mean, we've had since, since launch, three and a half million unique visitors um, and, and this is figures at the end of end of 2016 so it will be much higher now but at the end of 16 so a year and a half after launch three and a half million uniques um, you know there were almost four million visits there's four and a half million page views return visitors is really high you know high time on site and I look at that and go you know we've got stuff like I think it was 17 million minutes had been spent on the blue room engaging with our content so wow. there, there's some really, really big numbers. But I think the other one for me, if we move away from the vanities, it's starting to look at some of the brand and business metrics as well. So we've done research and, and for instance, you go, for people that have visited the Blue Room, 70% of them or more um, state that they love Booba. And I won't go into what the figures are for people that haven't visited the Blue Room, but it's significantly lower. You know, we've got, it's at least double for all of these metrics around purchase consideration, you know, understanding of, of the breadth of services that we provide. And I think those sort of metrics are really important as well as the vanity metrics, because it shows yeah. that it's actually delivering that true business value. I guess with the vanity, and, and it's, I know we use the term vanity metrics, but I mean, they're still really important metrics. Is your growth going up? I mean, that's uh, that's not vanity. That's, that's um, you know, are we growing? And I guess the one, one big thing, and now you could have taken, so you've been going probably a year and a half, a little bit more? A little bit more, almost two years now. Okay. So, but when you look at it, and this is where with content, you can dial up or dial down, you know, like you could have done that in, um five years or ten years but you chose to do it in close to two years so you've constantined it up and that gives you a great advantage because um you know unlike advertising on tv which is here and gone um you know an investment in content is is a digital asset that will continue on and i and a lot of the content that i've seen is, is certainly very much down the evergreen path which means that it's going to be relevant you know in a couple of years time as it is today so you know things will change of course but ultimately uh, i get a good sense that they're, they're, they're very much um uh you know evergreen articles that you know people would be searching for you you're solving a i guess a need yeah, you, you're spot on, Trevor. And it, it's looking to, I mean, if, if I look at those vanity metrics and I agree they're important, they, they've all doubled, you know, from year one to year two. And it's on an upward trend. It will keep growing. But it's looking at it for me and as it's a long-term investment through that content. I mean, ultimately, and we've got four really clear content pillars on the Blue Room, you know, the long-term goal is that we become the first place that people go after Google. We want to own search. Now, that's a really ambitious goal, but that we become the health destination for those content pillars. And that, that takes a lot more work, a lot more site. You know, you need to have a lot more than, than being just a content hub to achieve that. But that's what you're working towards. Would it be fair to say, Matt, that, um, you know, I guess that's the opportunity because, I mean, let's face it, health is, you know, everyone says get your niche, get your niche, you know, and niche down and there's a lot of sense around that. But ultimately, you know, it's there's so much information out there in this space, in the in the health space. But there's probably, is it fair to say, there's probably not too many Australian hubs of content that really nail it. There's just such a plethora of stuff everywhere, depending on what you're searching for. But there's no real destination um, that I'm aware of, anyway, that 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 encapsulates the the, the type of content that you're the subjects that you're touching on. You're spot on, and and we spoke with customers, and and that was at, at the very start. I mean, to get to these pillars, there there was obviously a lot of really deep business engagement to work out where made sense to play. You know, there was market scans around the opportunity, SEO, etc. But we then sat down with customers and actually spoke to them about these content pillars. Did they meet their needs, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And and that was invaluable. I mean, that actually helped. It didn't change the strategy, but we tweaked elements of it based on what customers said. But the reason I bring that. Up up is during that we were speaking to customers about 
would you visit the Blue Room? Do you see this as a resource? We, we sort of mapped their, their customer journeys in terms of when they were searching for information. And the feedback from customers was, there is no Australian site that provides this. There's lots of different sites that they go to, but they end up at you know, a Mayo Clinic or a WebMD or, or something like that. And they said, we want, an Australian, Australian. I mean, my take was company, but they want an Australian site that they trust that they can go to to be the source of their information, and that's the opportunity for us. Once you walk us through those pillars, those content pillars, and I take it that they, you know, you've got your audience avatars and and everything's locked together. Yeah, for sure. I mean. We've got, so the four, the four pillars are caring families, healthier and manage and recover. Um, and so I'll give you a bit more info. So caring for that is around, you know, when people are getting older, um, you know, how do they have the advice, the advice and, and care that they need, you know, to stay in their homes for longer, but then to make informed choices when they do need to move into aged care and the like. But it's not, it is definitely not an aged care pillar. It is around yep. empowering people to say, help keep their parents in their home for longer and you may need to look at you know doing abc to the shower to fall proof and all the like families is is really a resource you know and it's around how do we give how do we give parents the information to make their families happier and healthier and it, it's targeted we've got a real really strong focus on you know from from when children are born or, or in fact from the year before children are born to to the early two to three years but we're building that out now um, you know so that there's a lot more information for kids under 12 and this will continue to grow healthy is really around how do people improve their health so whether that's through diet running workplace health whatever it may be but it's giving people the information that they need to achieve their goals and then manage and recover is where we focus on a lot more of the uh you know what i'd call the clinical clinical content like if you you know if you've if you've had a heart attack how to how to recover or what you know what should you do to try and avoid it or diabetes or cancer or you know th those sort of more medical topics but i guess with them what what we're really conscious of too is we don't want to provide this really dry factual medical information i mean we we have some of that and we try and do it in a way that's not dry but it's it's looking at it. i mean there's inspiring stories about people who are cancer survivors or you know it, it's looking like one of my favorite videos we did was how to use um, how to use household items to, to to make a sort of a headscarf if you have cancer, you know, and that's been from a utility perspective that has completely landed and, and it's one of our most popular videos on the site. But it adds value, you know. It's 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 looking at it. It's going how do we sort of look at a consumption journey for people and have content that meets all of those different layers, not just the medical information. And obviously, you've got. Um, being the giant that you are, and all the all the, um, the the data that you've got, that that helps play a role. Obviously, you've spoken to customers, but you would have been able to break it down well before you even got to asking customers through all the data. Um, you know, knowing these are the issues, and these are the uh, certainly this is what people are claiming for. So uh, you, you'd you'd have all that at your fingertips. Did that play a role? It, it did completely play a role, but remember, it's it's not just claiming, it's not just health insurance. So it, it, it's looking at what are all of those touch points. Um, yep. But you, yep. you're spot on. The the, the data really, we, we have a heap of data, um, and that did play a massive a massive part in it. So let's let's uh, shift gears to influencer relations because you guys have been doing this for quite some time, and with that, let's uh, influencers mainly being bloggers. Um, how you you guys have been, um, you know, building relationships with bloggers over a long period of time. Uh, you've had awards for health bloggers. Do you want to walk us through when did you start doing that? Why why are you doing it? Are you still doing it? And have has the efforts that have gone on a few years back now intersected with the content you're creating through the Blue Room? Is there an integration happening there? Yeah, completely. I mean, as you say, we started the uh, Bupa Health Influencer Awards, as they were known, then probably, I should know this off the top of my head, but I'd say four or five years ago. Um, yeah. And it really started from a need in terms of we we recognised, you know, the power of bloggers and, and it's not the power, the trust that their audience has and, you know, it, another way to engage and build advocacy. So we started awards to recognise recognise top bloggers that aligned with areas that Bupa was really interested 
interested in having conversations with people. And I think those awards have grown over time. And if we look at, I mean, if I look at last year's awards, we had thousands and thousands of entries, the quality of bloggers that we're now getting. And it, as, as an example, you know, we've got some of the winners from last year were Styling Curvy or Baby Mac or, you know, The Art of Joy, Sesame Alice, you know, really, really high profile bloggers. And I look at these guys, their, their combined audience is bigger than some newspapers in Australia. And I think it's not just the reach though, it's the trust. So if you look at, if you look at all of the research around this, their audience trusts what they say, you know, and their audience actually reads it. It's not like you and I are skipping through two or three different pages on a on a newspaper site. And I think for Booper, that's provided us with almost this halo effect, um, yep. you know, and this immeasurable, measurable benefit. And I think the other one with the bloggers too is we work with them in really different ways, and it truly is partnering. So it's it's looking at how can we uh, how can we sort of say to them guys we're interested in this this is a really interesting story or topic we want to explore and we give them th that creative license if it's on their platform in terms of tell it the way that will suit your audience you know let's work together on it but we're not sitting there being prescriptive saying we want you to write abc because they know their audience better than us we use them to, you know, a, a lot of times to amplify content. We use them sometimes to write content for the Blue Room. I mean, it's it's this fantastic union now, um, and and the social team have done an incredible job. I mean, we've we've actually started running, say workshops for bloggers with Facebook, you know, and, and other sorts of elements or workshops to, to help them. And it's based on things they tell us they want to learn about, to learn more about data and analytics. And yes, it helps us if they get more sophisticated, but you go, it's not about that. It's about how do we form partnerships with bloggers so that we work together, you know, and we have that relationship as opposed to it simply being a paid or transactional relationship. You're speaking my language, my friend, because it's this whole notion of influencer marketing versus influencer relations. And I think the difference is when marketing get hold of it versus when PR people get hold of it. And uh, my take on it is, um, and that, you know, it's a Venn diagram and there's grey in between. But I think when people think influencer marketing at the moment, it's okay, there's a, 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 a YouTuber or an Instagram, probably more likely an Instagram of these days, um, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 followers and they'll, they'll write something nice about your brand for, you know, three or 400 bucks or whatever. And that's, that's a media buy. There's not, you know, there's probably no relationship. It's transactional, it's tick the box, but they might never do anything for you again. And, and that's, it is what it is. And if that works for people, fantastic. But I think when, um, you know, when, when a PR comms team get in and look at it for the longer term, the same with content, you're building these relationships over the journey and and I think the awards and recognising people is a fantastic way to do it and I, I remember when you first started and there was a lot of uh, really positive chatter about the awards, just the, the fact that you're out there recognising people. Um, but that I think where you've taken it since helping them become better bloggers and better publishers, um, you know, that's that's giving back and, and I, that, that's earned, isn't it? Like we talk earned media. To me, that's yeah. earned media. Earned media is also obviously getting a quote in the newspaper or, you know, an interview on radio or whatever, but you're earning the right for these people to build a relationship with you. Yeah, you're spot on. And I, I look at look at the work with influencers. I mean, I think when we started it, did we have this end point in mind? No, because we, we certainly didn't have the Blue Room in mind when we started the Blogger Awards. But I think now that we're in a scenario that we we are sophisticated in how we how we leverage social media, you know, where we have a platform that we can host blogger content or use to amplify content and we can partner with them. So it, it becomes a lot more sophisticated. And I go, those relationships are both paid and Earned relationships. I mean, we we do we do pay for you know activity with bloggers, but we also get a, an incredible amount of support from them for free. And that's as you say, it's because we've built these long partnerships. So the bloggers that work with us love Booper, you know, and, and they've been to briefing sessions. They're across our strategy. They get to choose what they work on. It's a lot deeper than that paid relationship. So they'll see they'll see content or activity that we're running, and they'll push that out to their audience because it resonates with them. And, and I think for us, that's the beauty. It's it's you've actually got the earned and the paid component of a relationship. And I like the way you, uh, you know, and when we talk about influencer relations, you can have a paid element because, you know, 
what are you bringing to the table? It's a value to them. What do they want? And then it's it's mutual exchange of value, obviously. But you know, if you're going to get them to write for you or to do what you know, I've, I've you know worked with influencers before with white papers, for example, and you know that that's just respecting them and their time and their expertise to you know to expect them to write for nothing. Um, you know, when you're such a big magazine. Now, there's there's times when you know a, a lot of people who are bloggers like yourself. Will write, will write for other people who have got a platform. So what do they bring to the table? A platform of an audience that I might not be able to reach. So that's, that's again, a mutual exchange of value. But now you're sort of such a big going con consumer uh, uh, concern, you know, they, they're, they're, you've already got them, you've got that relationship with them. They, they know, like, and trust you. You know, like, and trust them. And, you know, if you're going to get them to write, then, you know, there's something in it for them, uh, a little bit of cash money. Well, completely, and I, you know, they're, they're, I, I wouldn't call them a channel. Um, um, sorry, that's just got really sorry, echoey. Really echoey. Have you, is that okay for you? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. Okay, I'm straight. You've just cut out completely. No audio. Okay. Our technology uh, delights continue. So it, I, it's disrespectful to call bloggers a channel. I mean, they're so much more than that. They're their own, you know, individuals. They're their own publishers. Yeah, they, they are far more. But if we look at it from in terms of that paid conversation, we wouldn't ask Google to provide free AdWords. You know, you wouldn't. You wouldn't when you want to take out traditional advertising. So it's being really conscious and respectful that they and, and that's where I don't like to call them a channel but if you look at them as part of that mix they are a channel and you do need to pay for it and I think it's unrealistic to to expect people to give up their time to create connections with their audience for nothing yeah but over and above the things that if they like the brand and they do little things like share your content or whatever so uh, or spread the word about the awards or all of that so to my mind it, it um, it covers so much of that ground and it's a great example, but it's taken you years. It could be four or five years you've been doing it for and, and people want those instant results and they ain't going to get it. You know, you don't build a relationship, particularly an organised, you know, it's not it's not the, so much the logo and the brand that's building the relationship, it's the people within it and the representatives of Booper who, who you know, they're the that's who's got the relationship and, and no doubt that that relationship spreads now throughout the organisation. Yeah. You're spot on. And I mean, if I look at the award ceremony last year, we had senior exec there, we had our managing director, we had the MDs of various business units uh, interacting with bloggers, presenting awards, you know, and for them, it, they they found it really, really interesting to hear their stories and to talk to them and to get their view their view on things as well. So it, it, it's a powerful sort of union. But I, if I think back to when we started and we were probably, oh, close to the first major organisation uh, corporate to start these. So you, you had you had various sort of awards, like I'm just trying to think back to, um, you know, some of the other ones, but they were sort of block, like you had the Writers Academy or you had, you had different sorts of awards. There weren't a lot of corporates playing in this space at this sort of level. And what we found is, it's, it, of course, it's valuable for Booper, but it's really valuable for the bloggers. So a lot of the bloggers, the credibility from them, and, and I've spoken to them about this, we've been recognised by Booper as the winner of the X category. It has helped sort of springboard their growth and professionalism as well, but it gave them, you know, other corporations then looked at them and thought, well, gee, if they won this award and been recognised with Booper, they, they, you know, they, it gave them that halo effect. And I think that's where it's been really handy. And and for those, you know, a lot of those bloggers have gone on to write books. You know, a lot of them, there's ones now who are overseas doing interviews with Alan and Oprah. I mean, the, the growth of some of these guys, which I watch is incredible, but we can still call them, talk to them, ask them to do yeah. things. You know, and they, they may say yes or no, but you go, as another company, if you were going in cold, it would cost you $15,000. You know, it's and, and that's where it is. It's you, you've invested in a relationship yeah yeah I hear you and it's this is where you, you know you've got this classic the integration of owned earned and social which you know I bang on about um, and sitting at the middle of that because one will lead to the other which will lead to the other which will lead to the other and uh, the other part where you're partnering too and again I'd call this even earned media um, is that you are uh, partnering with uh, is it the stroke foundation and other other non-profits like that in terms of content so do they provide content to you or do you provide it to them? Um, do they 
Do they share it through their networks? You share their content? How does that work? And again, a partnership, quid pro quo. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of different ways it works. I mean, we've had the Stroke Foundation's a great, great example that they've produced probably 30 or 40 articles for the Blue Room, um, but it's not just them. I mean, we, we work with multiple organisations and I guess what, what we have with the Blue Room is scale and reach that some of these smaller organisations don't have. So, it, it, again, it's a win-win relationship. So, if you look at the Blue Room and you see articles, it's very clear this is provided by X organisation. This is a link to their website. You know, it's quoted quoted by them we're, we're we're really proud of the fact that we've got these external organizations as contributors who are experts and subject matter experts so for them we're helping them to build their brand we're, we're then pushing it out via social or other channels and it's it's getting a lot more audience yes we get the traffic but when we're, we're then happy to pass that traffic back to these organizations so it's a nice way to do it and i think it was a real change for for Booper that typically we used to look to produce a lot of this content ourselves. And now it's going, what will best meet the customer needs? So let's say it's an article around, uh, what's a good example? Around, let's say it is around stroke for argument's sake. The Stroke Foundation, or if it's cancer, the Cancer Council, unequivocally are the experts, they are the premier organisation. So let's get the information from them that meets a customer need, but then we supplement it with where do we have IP? You know, it's I don't see these guys as competitors. It's a complementary relationship in terms of meeting a customer need. And I guess, you know, if you go back to traditional PR and, you know, let's get, you know, it's, it's um, you know, public education on behalf of the, of the non-profit and they want to, you know, get people talking about stroke or cancer or heart disease or prostate cancer, whatever it is. And, you know, they've always gone to the media and mm. as you should, because that gives you your reach. Now they're their own media channels if they've done it well um, and built their audience. Some have better, you know, do it better than others, but I suppose yeah. I reckon everyone can always be much, much better at it. But you guys are now the media and, and um, I know we've talked about uh, visits, you know, over the period of time. Do you know what, the, what your uh, uniques are on a monthly basis? Uh, I, I should know this should know this off the top of my head. It'd, it'd probably be, I'm just thinking on the numbers, two, 250,000 uniques a month or thereabouts. So that, you know, that and that, they're people who are actually interested in that topic. And I guess, again, that's the difference between mainstream media is that it's mainstream and people are, you know, all looking at for different things. Whereas, you know, when, when you're, albeit it's a, a massive niche, but when you, it's still, it's still, you could call it's a niche. Uh, comparatively, yeah. they're, you know, they're, they're big numbers that, that are fantastic for the Stroke Foundation or any of those other non-profits that you deal with to be able to be on your platform. So rather than let's write an opinion piece for, you know, whatever magazine, they can, you are now in the mix. Now, they probably still do all that on tipping. They, you know, that's what, that's what um, organisations do to get extra reach. But now you're part of the media mix for them. Which, yeah, I mean, it's great and that's been the intent all along, but I think it's also looking for us, it's not just the uniques, it's the depth of visit that we get and, you know, it's the quality and the time on site. So, the you know, uniques are fantastic, but is it good traffic? Is it junk traffic? You know, so we've got really high repeat visitation. We've got people who are coming and because the content is 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 good and it answers their needs they're reading two three four articles they're printing them they're coming back to them and i think okay. that for me is that's what will help us achieve that goal of health destination rather than just how many people can we attract because we all know you can you know you can pay for traffic you can but if someone's there they bounce after three seconds they never go back you might have this really high high number but it's not quality and quality is our focus um, you know, particularly as we go forwards, do we need to keep growing? I mean, as I said before, we're, our numbers are, are going up on that trend. They're doubling, but it's, we'll get to a stage that you actually, the target market's engaging with it. So you go, it's less than about, about trying to increase the numbers and it's how do we deepen the relationship with people. Yeah, you can tell if people print. What's that? Sorry, Trev. Did you tell if people print? We can, well, got yeah. stats on that. Yeah, we do. Never, never thought about that. Um, and are yeah. you uh, are you building an email subscriber list on top of that? 
it it is at the very well it's probably it's the second or third on the to-do list so unequivocally we want to do it um and we do need to do it i think for us the, the there's some things that are probably more important to us so I, when i look at the blue room journey so we had it approved by the exec in november um and we launched in may the following year having a christmas break and when it was approved it was an idea in our heads there there was nothing there was no editorial strategy, content strategy, no hub, no hub design, no operating model, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And I think we launched uh, MVP, which I thought was most valuable player at the time, but it's minimum viable product. Um, and and we, so we, we had this frenetic build and I'm glad we did because if we'd waited until we were perfect, we still wouldn't have launched. So we launched, we learned, you know, we iterated, we, 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 can, we redesigned the site after three months because it wasn't as optimized as it could be. But I think in that, the the one the one area that in hindsight we could have done a bit better was SEO. So the focus for us now is how do we make sure that every piece of content and the site in its entirety is optimized as much as it possibly can be. And I think that's that decision's been made and it's the right decision to go rather than rather than having a focus on on what else can we do, like an ADM, let's make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck out of everything we've got and then we can look at other elements and so with seo um you know there's a number of different camps on seo one is you do whatever you have to do to get the get the traffic through and it's all about traffic 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 and then there's others where it's a bit more human seo and uh you know you, you've got to write for humans first and and robots second whereas um you know the other way is we're writing for the robots and bugger the humans <laughs> yeah I think, I mean, for us, it's a, it's a mix of both. I mean, we're unequivocally like the first checkpoint for does content go on the blue room is does it have utility? You know, that is number one. So it has to make sense for a customer. Now, or not a customer for the audience. There is some content, though, that is specifically written with keywords in mind because we know it helps us rank. Um, yep. So I think, it, I think it's a mix of both. I, th I, I don't... I don't think you will be ultimately successful just taking an approach where you have one. And it's a bit like for me, I mean, I look at SEO and go, it is critically important, you know, but it's it's how do we also, it's an element within that sort of converged operating model. So we've got paid owned earned integration, you know, you've got within that, you've got media, you've got influencers, you know, we've got the Blue Room is now integrated in all business activity. So our members um, receive Blue Room content in health insurance EDMs. You know, we've got magazines that go out, it's got Blue Room content. Whenever there's a marketing campaign for any of our businesses, we produce blue room content and we'll sit down and understand what are their business goals, what are the CVP, but then we produce content in a blue room style for it, which doesn't have product or pricing information. That's pushed out through social. And I think it's really important with that SEO chat to, to look at it and go, is it important? Yes, because you want to build up that sustainable findability in traffic, but it's also part of the mix. I mean, if you're just doing SEO, um, you know, yeah. you, you can't control who's finding it. Are they the right people, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So it, it's a pillar, but it's not the it's not the solution. So, of what percentage, if you know, off the top of your head, that people are finding you through Google versus you know people who know about you? Yeah, I should, I sh again, I should know this off the top of my head, I don't. Um, I think it's around, I think it's around 30% of, of our traffic's organic. And I think for us at the moment, what what the focus is, is, so, so we do pay for some of our traffic, maybe it's around 40% or the like through, you know, through amplifying through social or the like. I We look at this and go, the, the midterm goal is that, if we can get to a stage where we're ranking number one, two, three for our pillars on Google, we can then invest money um, where it's where it's really important and targeted. So you will always have that always on social element, but you go, it, it will stop being a traffic driver because organic repeat visitation, et cetera, et cetera, has overtaken it. Then we can invest greater amounts of money across different paid channels where it's strategically important as opposed to being that always on traffic pool. So, in terms of um, let me let me just go back to uh, the paid side of things. So, I guess there's the um, there's the uh, native advertising side of things. Have you ever done anything like that to you know th through an outbrain or one of those platforms to try and just 
uh, get that awareness and that reach really quickly? And, and it, you know, do you still use it or did you use it early or what, what's the scenario there? Yeah, we, we used Outbrain particularly around launch um, and, and it was fantastic. You know, it was a really, really good way to help amplify our message to a broader audience. Um, I think as time's gone on, we've probably invested more of those funds in in our own channels um, or, you know, rented channels as, as you and I have discussed, like a Facebook or the like, where I think we've got a little bit more control over the audience. And I think the benefit with things like that is it's then building, you know, audience pool and the like that we can cross leverage down the track. But that said, I think, you know, there's there's various distribution mechanisms like an Outbrain. They were incredibly helpful in helping us hit our year one goals. We, we wouldn't have got there without them. Okay, that's good insight. And, the, uh, and let's just kind of finish on social media because it's sort of floated through the conversation. But um, what channels is, have you got, uh, has Booper got, and... Um, how has the, the content hub, the Blue Room, obviously it helps the social channels and the social channels help it. Uh, can you just uh, give us a few insights around that? Yeah, so we operate LinkedIn, uh, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, obviously. Um, you know, plans in place, looking at what do we do with Instagram and the like, where else do we go? So it's, it's. I mean, and we, we do play on Instagram, but that's probably the primary channel for us from a corporate thought leadership is LinkedIn um, and from a customer perspective, it is Facebook. I think for us, it's also looking at YouTube going, the search volumes there is how do we make sure that, how, how do we get to a stage where it becomes a strategic asset rather than a repository. Um, but yeah. I think for us, it's it's all an opportunity. I mean, there's so many things you could do, whether it's podcasting or w whatever it looks like. And and they're, they're, they're all really good. Like, oh, I love the Jay Bear quote that social's fire, oh, sorry, the content's fire and social's gasoline. I actually slightly would reword that with no disrespect to Jay, that content's fire and syndication is gasoline. It's not just social. It's, you know, it's that integration across the physical and digital paid owned earned channels that works. But I think for us, the social, it's been an incredible enabler. And when we're designing, so within the Blue Room team, we have content marketing and, and, and editorial and the social team. So we are looking at pieces of content and campaigns with that lens of, what will work on social, what will work on the Blue Room, where's the intersection, you know, and, and let's develop bespoke content where we need to. So I, I think that integration is key, that if, if you're not designing the content, thinking about how it will be amplified on social and, and what does need bespoke, what does and what will work, I don't think you'll be as successful as you are by having that sort of integrated view. And so I, I'm a great believer that you know, media relations are still very important, um, and but the way media relations is done has changed quite a bit because obviously um, less journalists and less producers, etc., out there, um, they're having to do a lot more desk research versus going out and being on the beat. And in fact, probably some journos are, are running two or three beats versus they used to probably focus on one. So obviously the um, you know, the desk research is quite big and, and having experts, which you guys have got as well, um, that you're highlighting those experts. And we've talked before about the Edelman Trust Barometer and, um, you know, internal experts are one of, and are one of the, um, you know, the highest uh, and most most credible sources of information for a company. So you're, you're out there doing that and they're, there are uh, obviously their channel is the blue room largely but have you found that by having content out there and building that audience and getting it shared and all of that have you had the media and, and when i say media it could be bloggers podcasters you know media traditional and new media outlets have you had them sort of wanting to syndicate your content or asking for your uh, experts because they've read about them is Anything, any light you could shed in that area? Because it's a bit more, um, you know, it's a bit more, oh, well, I don't want to say esoteric. There's a lot of nuance around that side of things, but I definitely see it again and again and again working. Um, it's just, a, again, another longer-term play. 
Yeah, and look, the the short answer is yes. We we've certainly found, uh, you know, that there is a much broader audience that is engaging with Boopa, whether they're journo's or bloggers, because of the blurum and syndicating that content. But that said, that our corporate affairs team do an awesome job, and it, I think it would be, you know, silly of me to say that their success is because of the blurum. But let me answer the question a different way. So where we work hand in hand with our corporate affairs team, would they we're now looking at when we're developing content, what's the role that corporate affairs can play and how does that intersect with, with Blue Room and social? And an example example of this I love is we had we filmed a story uh, with, a, with a young girl and, and uh, Luke Hodge, who plays for Hawthorne Footy Club, who Boopa sponsors a while ago. Really, really beautiful story. You know, and the young girl had some challenges, but beautiful story with her and Hodge. Our corporate affairs team had sold that in as an exclusive to Channel 7. So the Channel 7 film crew was there filming it. The Blue Room film crew was there filming it. We've then we've then released the story on the same day, you know, and it, it's able to leverage it. We've had other instances where corporate affairs have sold in an exclusive to someone like uh, News Limited um, and given them all of the information. We've then had all of the media release, the case studies and everything else live on the Blue Room told in a Blue Room style. So it wasn't a, you know, a typical media release, but it had the info the media needed. The corporate affairs team were then sending a one paragraph email to media outlets directing them to the Blue Room to find all of the information they need. And I think that for me is, is where we're starting to get really successful is going, how does, how does traditional media, um, you know, integrate with content and social because it's all completely complementary. They are, they are, and and again, it just shows that if you do create really good stories, um, brand journalism, as uh, our friend Raquel Eberly would say from Newsmoto, uh, brand journalism, uh, brand storytelling, tell it, call it what you will, but it is, you know, rather than, you know, there's places for utility-based content, but what's really going to gravitate across the line is not just that basic utility content it's going which is great for seo and everything it's more of that uh, storytelling the human stories that you can tell so again it's um, you know we've spoken before about you know utility based content thought leadership based content uh, you know is there corporate content and how can you tell that in a better way and and promotional content but it, the, the the more that it's human then the the, uh, the better the chance of resonating Completely. Awesome, mate. Well, I'll leave it there. Um, so, what's the address of uh, the Blue Room? Because it's Booper Blue Room, isn't it? Yeah. So it's uh, www.thebluroom, all one word, dot booper.com.au. Excellent. Excellent. All right, mate. Thanks very much, Matt, for all of that. Um, great. Great story. It's good to see. You know, we, we do cover a lot of the, the a lot of the action is at the smaller end because you know they can move a lot quicker and get things done. And enterprises now, the, the enterprise collectively uh, is now starting to get in this space and uh, see it out. Whereas you know, I guess you go back a few years and people wanted instant results, but I think the the message is getting through that you you know you're building relationships, you're de de deepening the intensity of connection with your audience, um, and you're building trust. And you can't outsource that. <laughs> that's no. that's uh, got to be built up over time. And you're building digital assets that are actually you'll hit a tipping point at some some time uh, where it even works for you, even a bigger spin-off. So uh, yeah. it's great. It's great yarn and great to hear the behind the scenes of uh, the Booper, the Blue and social media influencer relations. You're, and, and Trev, you're spot on. It is a marathon, not a sprint. So, but look, been great talking with you. So thanks for having me. Okay, mate. Thank you. See ya.